Today's show is a very special show. We have as our guest Laura Ness, renowned wine journalist, wine competition judge, food writer, and travel writer, all focusing on the world of wine. She's been on our show before. We are lucky enough to have her back today, and she is going to take us on a trip that goes all around the world and gives us some tips on how to not only enjoy wine, but where to buy it and why to buy it. This is going to be a fun show. Wine with Bill starts now. Welcome to Wine with Bill. And I'm Bill. Today, we are very lucky to have a guest from season two. This is now season three. Laura Ness, renowned wine journalist, wine competition judge, food and food writer, travel writer. She is based right here in the Santa Cruz Mountains AVA. Laura, great to have you back. Thanks for having me back. Well, let's get started. Since let's you were do last, that. since you were last here, there's been a lot happening in the wine world. Oh my gosh! Whether it's local, national, international, but let's start out. I believe. You fill me in. Yeah. I think we have a new AVA down in the, uh, it's called what, the San Luis Obispo Coast? Right, the Slow Coast, yeah. Uh-huh. So that um, was official in the beginning of the year, and it covers about 47 miles of coastline, uh, Santa Barbara, r- uh, roughly, and mostly Chardonnay, um, Pinot Noir, there's some um, Riesling down there. And it's just a way to kind of carve out a little bit of the unique terroir of that part of the world, which has become extremely popular. And I think will just become more so. Um, They were very lucky to escape the ravages of the CZU fire of 2020. That was one of the kind of go-to places for wineries in the San Lucia Highlands and the Santa Cruz Mountains that got pretty much wiped out they were able to get some fruit from from down there so we're, we're excited about that but I wanted to mention there's another AVA okay that's a little more relevant to our neck of the woods and it's the Gabalin Mountains which is the mountain range that Calera is part of Mount Harlan that Josh Jensen mm-hmm. who passed away earlier this right. year um, established um, back in the in the late uh, in the late 70s early 80s and the Gabalin Mountains is um, 98,000 um, square miles, and it is 30 miles long, and it's basically defined by elevation. So it's 1,500 to the top of the highest peak, which is 2370. And the, probably the most relevant um, vineyard from that area is Coast View, which Big Basin Vineyards fans will recognize as being a very large part of the portfolio that Bradley Brown has at, at Big Basin Vineyards. And Coast View was planted by Josh Allen, and uh, his son now manages it. And it is one of the most interesting vineyards I've ever been to. I drove up um, in an old rabbit um, car, for those of you <laughs> who might not know what that is, um, driven by Ian Brand, who is a very famous winemaker from the Santa Cruz Mountains um, region, and is now in Monterey. And he drove me up to the top of this mountain uh, some years ago. And I I will never forget the feeling of driving around the edge of the of the cliff, constantly winding around the outside lane. On the outside lane, there's no guardrails, there's nothing. And I remember Tony Craig, who used to be the winemaker at at David David Bruce and is now at uh, at, uh, Savannah Chanel and also his own brand, um, Sonnet. He said the scariest moment of his life was driving a grape truck up to pick up fruit from from up there. And it was Syrah and it was extraordinary. And yeah, so we're excited to have that part of the world kind of carved out as its own AVA. The kind of interesting part too is that of the vineyards that are in the Gabalin Mountains um, AVA, which was just um, approved by the TTB, is that many of them are in Shalone. And so you have the actual Shalone, you know, the original um, Shalone, AV, uh, Shalone Vineyard. And there's Michael Michaud's Vineyard. Michael Michaud had a tasting room in, in Saratoga for a time. Um, Bill Brousseau, who's a winemaker at Testarossa, right. his family has a vineyard there and he makes his, his own brand from, from there. And then there's a couple of Boer Vineyard, which uh, was a, a guy who used to be the uh, vineyard manager for Shalone. 
and the Shalon uh, vineyards kind of make up the largest number of vineyards in that AVA, but the other two that, that people will recognize are Calera, Mount Harlan, and, um, and Coast View. So, so yeah. what are the varietals that are the, the oh, top of the line there? In I, that certainly uh, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay are, are very established in all of the vineyards that I uh, mentioned. Um, also at Coast View, you have Syrah, you have Grenache, you have Morvedra. Bradley Brown basically commissioned John Allen to plant um, some varietals that he was very keen on at, at the time. And I think there is some Viognier up there that might be Ruzan. So it's a, it's a really cool um, spot. Most of the vineyards in Chalon are pretty much, it's Chenin Blanc um, at Chalon, and it's Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and maybe a little Syrah at most of the others. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, segueing into one of your other specialties, wine competition judging. Oh my gosh. <laughs> what have you done this year and, and what's coming up uh, for on your on your on your schedule of events, schedule of judging? So, in addition to all the really great competitions I've been a part of and I got to judge a Central Coast competition this year which was held in Paso Robles and and that that was great because I love Paso and don't spend as much time there as I used to do in the past. Uh, but that that was interesting. We we had um, in the, the the finals were d done a little differently than some of the competitions I I, I judge, and, and it's all about who runs the competition and their rules. And and this was very interesting. In the finals, the buyers, like the guys who buy for Albertsons, Safeway, you know, wine bars. Um, Total Wine, those kind of, of folks, they look at a wine not so much as, do I think this is a really great wine? Is this a wine that I would serve to my friends? But is this a wine I can sell off my shelf? And so we came down to a little tussle. We, there was a Cabernet Franc that was outstanding, really, really good. And kind of the purists in the group, I consider myself one of them in this particular case, were voting for the Cab Franc. And it was clear that the buyers also really liked this wine, but they voted for the Cabernet Sauvignon just because it was a Cabernet Sauvignon. And you know, at that point, I'm like, well, that's the way the world works. These guys have to sell the wine off their off their shelf. And the other great competition was uh, the fourth annual uh, International Canned Wine Competition. And you get it. Canned, canned wine? Canned, canned wines. There were 300 entries from all over the world. I'm not kidding you, Japan. Uh, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, Austria, Germany, everybody's getting in on this. And wow. I tell you, it it was really eye-opening. The categories were fascinating. And I'll just say that most of the whites, the white varietals in cans and the sparkling versions of those were really quite good and very refreshing and you know really appealing and you can really understand that cans are a tremendously convenient way to take wine to the beach backpacking boating you know gosh knows where sneaking in the basement you know whatever these are things you can throw in your purse your backpack you don't have to have a you know thermos you don't have to pretend that you're drinking water out of this ginormous thing that's clearly filled with wine Rick Steves would approve of yeah, this yeah I agree yeah so the cans are fun too because there's the, the little guys little 275s and then there's the kind of the soda can beer you know Miller Lite you know Bud Light size and the the big part of cans is that they have to be coated. They have to be specially coated in order to preserve the wine and to keep the wine from, you know, basically er interacting with the with the aluminum in the, in the can. Which is why a lot of people tried cans years ago and went, "Eh, tastes like can." And that's because wine, unlike beer, is quite acidic. And so there's rules for how much acid that wine can have before it goes in the can. And the canning you know, people are extremely clear with the wineries on the chemistry that's allowed. So we've advanced tremendously just over the last four years in terms of chemistry and and um, and understanding what works, you know, in, in a can. I can't believe some of the stuff people put in cans. Having just said how great the whites were, there were some wines that I really just couldn't even tell you why. And the biggest category of, of what were they thinking was the low and no alcohol wines, which are wines that are made, you know, fermented and 
yeast turns the sugar to alcohol. This is kind of the normal way things go. And then they strip all the alcohol out. Yucko. I mean, you're left with a what do I do with this you know, kind of thing. But we did discover an amazing Pinot Noir from New Zealand. Okay, what, are some, what are some of your winners or oh, ones okay, that you so, can recommend highly? So the one, some of the winners are, you know, Obscurica, right? I mean, they're, you're just not going to be able to find them um, unless you talk to the guy who put the canned wine competition <laughs> together. But the ones that I will highly recommend are all very obtainable. Okay. And they're from a, a company called Maker. And Maker was founded um, as a... A graduate school thesis by a couple of really bright women from Stanford and their um, idea for the business was hey there's all these really cool winemakers out there they're small um, they don't have a way to kind of get out there in the world like Testarossa people don't know them like Mount Eden how do we bring them to the market and deliver their product to people like us who are young and you know active and like to do a lot of sports and travel and we're, we don't want to lug around a heavy bottle of wine and they came up with the idea of canning. So they chose some really uh, unique and fun different varietals made by really solid winemakers. And they took, they got a canning line, they bought the best cans, they had the best marketing, and they took the canning line out to the different wineries and canned all the wine. So it's all controlled and it's called Maker. So the, the top wine that, that I had at that competition was a Handley Cellars Chardonnay the very first Chardonnay that Maker put in a can, and I was part of the trials because they were looking for that perfect Chardonnay that chemistry-wise worked really well um, with for the can program, and also would appeal to a broad, you know, range of, of palates. And I think they they nailed it. I mean, this wine was so head and shoulders up above the other white wines, and it was the only Chardonnay that, in cans that that I think really scored highly. Mm. And then the Handley Cellars Pinot Noir was another really good one. And then Nicole Walsh, who is the winemaker for Sayre and also has been, you know, Randall Graham's right hand woman for 25 years now at uh, Bonnie Dune. Um, she has several uh, cans under the Maker label, including a Grenache Rosé and a Sparkling Riesling and a Cabernet Pfeffer, wow, which that's is a, a red big variety. Wow. Yeah, and uh, I th she's doing another um, wine for them this year, and they keep adding to the portfolio. So, if you go to um, Maker, I think it's MakerWine.com, um, they have a canned wine club, which is really cool. And every quarter, or you know, you, I think you do it monthly, but they'll send you an assortment. And what's really great is that. The, the wines are, 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 are all excellent, and the packaging is so, is so cool that you feel like, you know, very chic to take a can out of your purse and, you know, plunk it down on the table. And you can drink it right out of the can, or you can pour it in a glass. But yeah, I'm really excited about the can, canned wines and where they're going. And you know, think about it, people recycle cans way more than bottles. And even though, yeah, there's a heavy lift in terms of environmental impact, taking all the, the materials that are used to put the cans together, but they're much more easily turned into other, other aluminum That's products. Right. I, my comment from listening to you is three things. One, it's, it's a great idea, and it's, 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 it's taken hold. Number two is environmentally, hello, it's a win-win. And marketing is really just, it's, it's, it's wide open. Is there data that says, oh my gosh, 5% of the wine sold in California or nationally is in cans now, or is, I'm, I'm going to presume it's increased it's in the growing, last four to five years. The percentage of wines in can is growing year over year by about 10%, so that's wow. a pretty healthy. Wow. Yeah, more and more people are putting wines and wine-based products like seltzers and, you know, coolers and the, that sort of thing in, into wow. cans. But, yeah, the, the other thing about cans is they really retain the cool, I and mean, they take they they hold that cool once they're you know in the once you've chilled them down and a, you've got a third of a bottle in the in the two in the 275s and like and a half in the in the three in the in the larger size and so you don't if you just want you know a glass and a half wine rather than a whole bottle and you don't have a place to store it well the can you know really hits, fits the bill I'm Bill. thinking of my golf bag. There you go. Oh, my gosh. Um, it will set you right up. Let's not go there. <laughs> let's not go there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, let's take a break here. And when we come back, we're going to talk about a little more specificity with our own AVA here in Santa Cruz Mountains. And we're going to talk about uh, some of the interesting food and wine uh, 
things that you've discovered, whether it be a good place to, a little hidden wine secret to, for travel, uh, and some of some of the stuff about just, I'm gonna call it day-to-day -day life with wine. Okay. You gotta have life with wine, right? Absolutely. All right, we'll be right back. Thank you to the Los Gatos Community Foundation for their continued support of KCAT Public Media. Because of groups like the Los Gatos Community Foundation, KCAT has been able to inspire, educate, entertain, and inform our community through the magic of television and digital media for over 38 years. Thank you. We're back. and. Let's focus on our own Santa Cruz Mountains AVA, Laura. And what have the local owners, winemakers told you about the 2021 harvest? Uh, I think we had no fires and smoke. It was, it, it was good in, in that sense, but how did everything go with the drought, et cetera? So there's two parts to that question. Um, the harvest was really great. Everyone was extremely thankful that it went off without any fires and you know undue heat stress. It was a nice, even ripening year uh, in 2021. And so they didn't have all the grapes coming in at once, which is a nightmare because you just you run out of space and labor is tighter and tighter and tighter. So finding people to pick when everything comes in all at once is just a monumental disaster. And we're hoping to avoid that this year. It's been warm in the last few days. It's going to be get really warm again this week. So that's pushing all of the grapes and a lot of them will be, you know, ripening around the same time. So there might be a bit of a labor crunch, but that did not happen in 21. I think you could say it was ideal, um, except for the drought, which is definitely having an impact. And I know that, um, you know, Jeffrey Patterson has made um, mention of the lower, um, you know, cluster count and the smaller clusters, smaller berries. This is all due to, you know, to a lack of, of, of water. So that that's a big uh, stress point. Um, certainly in, in areas that are, you know, prone to, to frost, there's less water in ponds for, for frost protection. So, you know, 2021, I, I think, is shaping up to be, I mean, the, the 2021 rosés that I've had are, are, are all quite good. Everything is is really solid, so I think that's good. And so you're always just worrying about the next thing, you know, like 2022. What's going on for 2022? Well, I would say we're a little earlier in the inland areas, the warmer areas, uh, because of the fact of that, that big high pressure that comes from the desert southwest that's been over the four corners, yeah, that's yeah. been spinning, you know, all that monsoonal moisture, which definitely had an impact here in the Santa Cruz Mountains, um, especially the vineyards along the coast. Um, there's There was a low pressure system sitting off that kind of squeezed the high, so the high sat over you know, basically the inland, and it was cooler, of course, along the coast, there was still fog, and then you had the monsoonal moisture coming up, and a lot of it came up the coast, because there was that hurricane remnant that kind of got spun in there, and so you had monsoonal and tropical moisture that was um, kind of a problem, um, because the vines that are near to the ocean always have high mildew pressure just because of the fog and then when you add in a you know a stray shower and humidity like wow well, I mean it was really humid there for for a while that can cause botrytis in in the bunches oh, so okay. so the the vineyard guys who are you know farming those vineyards are very cognizant of you know that that problem and um then the other thing that happened in, in the early part of, of, of this year was some vineyards got hit with the wind. We had uh, quite a lot of wind and cooler weather, and the, when vines were blooming, they got, um, they got knocked off. Basically, the blossoms got knocked off. So there's a really low set, like down in Santa Clara County. Um, one of the uh, winery owners I was talking to says um, her white wines pretty much got wiped out because oh. of that. So, you know, what's good in one you know, little pocket might not be in another. So w the, the real story here is that the Santa Cruz Mountains has so many different pockets. You've got the summit area where it's 
generally a lot warmer. You've got Carlitos, and Carlitos has some really sunny, very warm, exposed areas, and then you have some that are more tucked away. It's all about orientation. And when it comes down to, to, to winemaking, it's all about the particular soil, the particular angle, elevation, slope, and, and you'll see it if you drive through and you look at an area where a lot of vineyards, you'll notice the rows going, like, they'll go this way, and then they go this way, and they go that way, and you're like, why is that? And that it is to maximize the, usually it's to maximize sunlight. The exposure. Yes, yeah. and also to be able to manage not so much exposure to the west, where there's such a long, you know, period of of intense heat, right? Because the sun is hotter in the in the afternoon. So yeah, that's the story of the Santa Cruz Mountains. Is that each little area is kind of its own. They are very unique. Its own little fiefdom. Yes. Well, good. Exactly. Well, let's switch a little attention, different direction. But you write about food and wine. Uh, please tell our viewers, listeners, some good Santa Cruz Mountain AVA slash Silicon Valley restaurants, wine bars, whatever that really nail it and you can highly recommend uh, for their expertise, food and wine pairings and, 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 and value as well. So that's a pretty broad scope, but um, we do have a lot of variety here, you know, th thankfully. Um, I think some, some of the best food um, and wine pairing that you will find would be at uh, Le Papillon and, and Asa. Um, those folks really understand food and the components and what, what really works. Um, I like uh, Le Lexington House also has a very unique uh, set of wines and of course they have great cocktails and I love their food. It's quite different. I um, also really like Vino Cruz in, um, in Soquel. It used to be in Santa Cruz and then um, moved because the Museum of Art History down there took over their space. But they, they have the biggest selection of Santa Cruz wines. If you really want to have a Santa Cruz AVA experience, Vino Cruz is the place to go. Uh, they have a huge wine shop, all the wines from the area. Um, they try to represent every, yeah, they, every I've, single I've one. I've been there, and I have to say from day one, and including their, recent, their current location, they're a great ambassador for, oh, the, yeah, for the absolutely. ABA. They yeah. really are. And their wine list is amazing. I mean, it's kind of hard to beat that wine list for, you know, the extensive, you know, number of local wine. And they have some imports as, as well. And SWAF is another fabulous resource. Um, an, another um, restaurant here that I, 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 for food, I, Shepherd and Sims is amazing. Yes. I, Take people on there. The Boulevard, all, right. Take people there all all, all the time. Um, wish they had a better wine list, uh, but um, it's great food. Um, I think um, also Alderwood down in Santa Cruz is amazing food, and they've got a really great wine list too, kind of more eclectic. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, of places to to choose from. We have we're we're pretty blessed here, in the in okay. the area. Well. Let's take it a little more sharper focus and take it into the travel mode that these hidden gems that we have in Northern California where it, everything is combined and, and, and is, is in perfect harmony. The, wine, the, the wineries that you can uh, sample, the food, the lodging, mm -hmm. the, the, the vistas. Yeah, the, we, we, have, we have- Tell me where a, I should a, spend a, my next $2,000. <laughs> Well, that, that's really easy to do <laughs> if you head north. Um, but I, I recently um, stayed in, in two areas that I have to give a shout out to. Uh, you know, obviously the Santa Cruz Mountains and San Santa Cruz. I have a lot of friends who, who have come from, you know, their wine region in Sonoma, Napa, and they come down and they spend time here and they're going like, oh my God, this is so great. Well, and we love going up there. So it's it's really great to be able to spend time in another region and, and realize not only how great you have it where you are, but also how fantastic it is to go somewhere else. So the Dry Creek Valley is really a, oh, yeah. an exciting, you know, area. You know, Ridge has gotten their Zins from Dry Creek and they have a big facility up there in Geyser, Geyserville. Um, they've that's been around for you know 40 some years and there's so many 
wonderful little wineries up up there in in Dry Creek. I'd just give a shout out to um, one VML, which is part of Truett Hurst, the winemaker uh, for them. Ross Reedy is also the winemaker for Ferrari Ranch Wines um, out of Coralitos. And we recently spent time with him and the the single vineyard Pinots are amazing. And I'm not a big Zin fan, but that Zin was fantastic. And the Sauvignon Blanc, he picks from six different vineyards. So the layers of fruit in that are just amazing. I think it was $29 a bottle. That was amazing wow. wine. And then um, I spent uh, some time at Papa Pietro Perry, which is in Dry Creek. They make a lot of Pinots, and they they have a, such a variety. They make Pinot from San, Sonoma Coast and Anderson Valley, and you know, of course, all throughout the the Russian River, and that that's a real great study in the differences in uh, uh, from vineyard to vineyard, and I like the way they, they they approach things. Pretty much, it's made all the same way except for the vineyard, so you're really tasting the vineyard. So I, I that was fun, and that uh, I stayed at. Uh, Madrona, the Madrona Inn, right. which is just beautiful. It's old. You've seen, you seen? Have you stayed there? It's Victorian, and they've redone everything on the property. I think it's under under new management, and the just everything about the decor and the ni- nice pool, the gardens, the the food. It was really really amazing. I have to say, I I appreciated that experience very very much. And you're so close to all the wineries. It's just incredible. And then um, Anderson Valley, uh, the uh, Indian Creek Inn is a really interesting place. It's got two big buildings and lots of rooms, you know, bedrooms, you know, they're private baths. And then they share like a common kitchen, living room, dining room. So it's a great place to, you know, hang out with a with a family or a group of friends, you know, rather than you know renting a, a VRBO, this is like fantastic. It's right on a creek. It, the owner is amazing, and you can pretty much walk to like four or five wineries to tasting rooms right there. So, Indian Creek Inn, big thumbs up. And then another place that I just wrote about for um, uh, Edible Monterey is the Inn at Newport Ranch, and it's a 2,000 acre spread of seven different microclimates and you literally go from the ocean you know standing on the bluffs looking out at the ocean and there's a a a cove where the the logging ships used to come in where they could anchor safely and they they would take down all the you know redwood trees and basically throw them into the boat from from up on 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 the cliff and and that that's um that's a really you know uh, that's a big legacy for that area. Is is uh, and what is, town is that? It, in, it's Laura? it's just north of Fort Bragg. Fort Bragg. Okay. And Fort Bragg was like a huge milling town. It was lumber, 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 and and now a a big part of that lumber um, mill area has been taken over by a conservancy group that is raising funds to try and put together something similar to what we have at the Monterey Aquarium. Oh, wow. So what they want to do, they've got all these skeletons from whales and you know different um, marine mammals that they've collected over the years, and so they want to put a, a museum together. But back to in at Newport Ranch, it's this really cool old house that's been turned into a big you know, dining room, living room. It's all, the wood paneling is amazing. The fireplace is incredible. I mean, the, the photos I took going back and looking at my trip from like four years ago, I. I, I, re- I was just reveling in the the detail and yet the simplicity of everything. So we stayed in this room that literally had redwood trees in the as part of the structure of the house. So you have these enormous posts that are, are, are redwoods. And the decks go all around, the views are amazing. And we took this ATV ride, which you can do, and it was raining it was wonderful we just we went through all these different microclimates and we were at the top of this ridge looking down at the an abandoned mining um, camp and you could see like where there were still you know nice little dairy ranches there's you know people with cattle and then you you co- you're on this ridge and you're looking at the ocean and it just goes on forever it's it's just at the tip of the lost coast what they call the lost coast and you go drop down on the other side and you're in this primeval forest unbelievable 
filled with moss and craggy trees and sorry it was waterfalls running everywhere birds of prey diving into the stream to get fish I, it was like another world just amazing like lord of the rings it, it was pretty cool it was pretty cool didn't didn't see anybody you know wearing furs or that sort of thing but it was pre- it was awesome and the food is great um really great place for for weddings and and uh, like a great venue yeah a great place to gather they have uh-huh. this huge table that seats like 30 uh, people all carved out of a single log pretty awesome wow oh yeah it's a it's a Very tremendous unique. uh wow. tremendous place so and of course wine is everywhere up there i mean men i just judged the mendocino wine competition and you have everything you've got the redwood valley it's got all these, you know, Rhone varietals and warm weather things, Italian varietals, and then you've got Anderson Valley, which is all the cooler climates, your Pinots, your Chardonnay, Riesling, Gewürztraminer, Chenin Blanc, and, you know, obviously uh, Pinot Blanc, Pinot Gris. So you've got these two worlds that you can access, you know, very, very quickly if you if you stay in Anderson Valley. So, Perfect. yeah, it was fun. Good. It was good. All time. right. Yeah. Here's some rapid-fire closing okay. questions. Here we go. Excluding the Coravin system, what is really the best way to preserve an open bottle of wine for the quality of the preservation, if you will, and the cost? The best, simplest, most efficient way to store wine is to put it in the refrigerator. And so if you have an open bottle, no matter how much or little is in it, you put the cork in tightly, or if you are really, really lucky and you have screw cap, love screw caps you turn that screw cap on tight and you stick it in the fridge and you know i i have multiple bottles open for days at a time because i like to see how a wine develops it's like getting to know a person you know you have company for three days they might be nice the first day you know what happens after but you know sometimes wine gets better as it opens and that's a really great thing you most of the time you're going like wow i'm really glad i didn't drink it all the first night because let's see how much better it got and then of course you have wines that are just instant like you know one hit wonders and they're out of here after the first glass they just go downhill but refrigeration is key key. and yeah and storing it cold to begin with and you know a lot of folks say oh i stick my wine in the garage i'm like that might be nice for one or two months out of the year, but we get fluctuation. And they go, oh no, it's really steady. I said, yeah, do you have a thermometer that you monitor that storage area constantly? Because the biggest problem with storing wine is the variation in temperature. So it, if it Highs goes and you know, up yeah. and down, yeah, so you want to keep it consistent. And so invest if you have wines that you really, really are, you, you, if you spent more than $50 a bottle on a bottle of wine, I want you to put it into a wine refrigerator. And if you don't have a wine refrigerator, stick it in that refrigerator in the garage that you've got all that beer in for your next party. Put the wine in the refrigerator. It's okay to store it at 40 degrees. It's better at 40 than at 75. Way better. It will live, it will live forever. I've pulled wines out of my wine cabinet that I, they're fairly high alcohol wines from Paso that I thought would be long dead. And they would have been if I'd left them underneath the staircase in my old house in, in Boulder Creek, where I thought was like really cool until I realized how really it wasn't that cool. I pulled wines out and they're like, they're, I mean, they're developed, they're, you know, 1980 something, they're definitely going to have age on them, but they're still okay. Whereas, you know, if you store them at normal room temperature in California, they're shot. They're just done. Good to know. Those yeah. are all great tips. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. Absolutely. Okay. I think we belong to the Rosé fan club. Yes, we do. Including rosé all year. Yes, all the time. Uh, give me a quick two or three that you've experienced, enjoyed, whatever, mm. and, that are, and that are still available on, on the market and haven't been sold out. Absolutely. I'll, I'll name the rosé, that one best rosé at the Mendocino Wine Competition. It's called Yokayo. So it's W-O-K-A-Y-O. I'm sorry, Y-A-K-A-Y-O. Yokayo. And it's a Sangiovese and it's $15. Wow. Um, it's from the Redwood Valley. It was I thought it was excellent. Um, my friend Rosa Fierro uh, from Fierro Cellars over in Livermore has a fantastic wine called Delicato. Um, it is a Grenache, and I tasted it at the Taste of Terroir, and it was fantastic. Another Mendocino wine is uh, Sassaferrato, and that's a Sangiovese, um, also fantastic. And then Alexander Valley uh, Vineyards Rosato of Sangiovese. You, I keep saying Sangiovese. It just makes a really fantastic food wine. 
But as we get into the hopefully cooler weather, then it's time to pull out the rosés that are a little more meaty. And I'd say the, the big basin um, blend of, of Grenache and Carignan, and um, it's got some Syrah and Morvedra in it. That's a really good good one. And uh, Cru, C-R-U, um, they are down in the San Lucia Highlands. They have a tasting room down there. They're Jose's Rosé, very nice. It's very pink. It's really pretty. It's just gorgeous, a lot of Grenache. And then Gamble up in Napa makes a rosé of Cabernet Sauvignon Merlot, Cabernet Franc, and Malbec. That is $26. Those are all different It's ros- amazing. Rosés. Yeah. It's $26, and it's got a little heavier pigment, as you generally do from those kinds of grapes, because the skins have a lot of color. That is a wine that you could, you know, chill and drink like a rosé or just have it at room temperature and drink like a light red and i'm just big big fan of that so yeah there's a whole lot of variety well thank you absolutely all right last question we are slipping into fall Mm -hmm. uh menus are going to change the weather's going to change people's whatever so give us some tips of maybe some best under 25 dollar wines that that people can get that's going to go with those fall menus this is where I tell you to go talk to my husband at Safeway. <laughs> um, the under twenty-five dollars uh, that that's really hard in the you know in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, there's a, a, a lot of you know decent uh, blends um, out there, and blends are pretty much what what you want. Or go to Inateca. I mean, those are the folks that have the imports. Because tw- Inateca it, direct it, or Inateca, it, Inateca Yeah, right. exactly. Either one of those great is going to have some wonderful, there. you know, Sanjos, Montepulcianos, you know, Barberas. Up in the foothills, you can maybe still find a bottle of Barbera for 25, but it's getting harder and harder. And the reason is that these small producers, which are the people that I like to support, they have to pay for farming. Water is expensive. Labor is intensely expensive. And the weather is always wreaking some kind of havoc, you know, on on you. And so you have, the prices have to go up. I mean, just think about what it costs to taste wine in Napa I mean it's a hundred dollars like minimum at some places and how many people are going to buy wine you know after a a tasting like that but I will say you know not to slam Napa there's so many great wines up there and there's a wine shop that I it's not a wine shop it's a wine tasting room and it's in downtown Napa and it's called New Frontier and they have everything you know all price points that and all many countries covered international international selection. but they've got a, a fiddle town barbera made by my friend joe shabel fantastic um they've got a uh, they've got cabernet you know from george III and all the fantastic vineyards in in napa you can spend anywhere from twenty dollars on a bottle of wine to 250 and just go, go and do it and taste a Syrah or a Grenache from Australia and your mind will be blown. I mean, you've just never tasted anything like it. Yeah, it's $250 a bottle, but just you, it, they caravan it and you, you can try it. And it's a, ma- a magical I- experience. And then you can buy a bottle of Sauvignon Blanc for $35 that will just make every other Sauvignon Blanc you've had look like, ah, oh, it just wants to be that. You know, it, it's care and wine taking, wine making, and it's the careful vineyard management and selection, like the VML um, Sauvignon Blanc that I was talking about. You can't get that kind of complexity from a single vineyard. You know, you have to, you have to build the kind of complexity that you get from that wine from the different vineyards. But this one um, from New Frontier, I, I thought was really, really fantastic, and just a great experience. And they're great guys. Well, yeah. This has been very informative, educational, entertaining, and inspiring not only me, but hopefully our viewers and listeners to get out there and do it. And you know what? It's inspired me to, I think I'm going to go home and open a bottle of wine I think you should. All right. By chance. Thanks again for being on our show. (laughs) It's a pleasure. Thank you very much.